<laughs> okay, so today we're going to be talking to Antia Boyd, who I had the pleasure of talking to about a week ago. We just sort of got to know each other, and it was really interesting. I, I, I really loved the way that you kind of structured our relationship. You, you, The way you sort of described it was you're often taking the clients that I'll, I'll get before they go on the breakup, and then I kind of get them after. So I would just love to pick your mind today specifically about some of the attachment styles and really an interesting thing I'm noticing with my coaching clients. But first off, how are you doing? Oh, so good, Chris. I'm so excited to be here. You know, we just past Labor Day weekend, so we're all ready to rock and roll. You know, get yeah. back to dating, get your ex back, let's go. <laughs> yeah, so why don't you tell us first a little bit about the Magnetize Your Man method? Because she's, first off, the coolest name ever, right? Magnetize uh -huh. Your Man. Um, and second off, what exactly do you help women do when they come into your orbit? Yeah, totally, totally. Yeah, so I actually developed the magnetizing man method from my own pain. You know, I was struggling myself, attracting a lot of emotionally unavailable men, which you can, ladies can relate to because they probably have breakups because of that, right? And, um, you know, and I developed a structure which is basically mapping, magnifying, and manifesting. So uh, one thing that needs to happen, we don't know what we don't know, right? So, you know, you don't know your blind spots. You don't know, I, I do lots of different readings. I look at a human um, being at many different levels. I studied personality psychology at UC Berkeley and really understanding, right? What is our internal dialogue? How it translates into action or it doesn't translate into action, right? And also how are we distorting actually our reality all the time? So that's what the mapping stage really looks at. It also looks at what are your unique gifts? Because we always believe, oh, once we go through a breakup, we have nothing to fall back on, right? Like our man is the, is the all, be all, end all. Right, right. But it actually, I teach in a mapping phase, like how many resources you have, particularly personally. So it's personal to every single person um, for yourself that you can totally rely on. Maybe you're incredibly intuitive or maybe you're incredibly, an incredible connector, whatever it is. But that's what we uncover too. So you can build that intrinsic confidence instead of just the extrinsic one, right? That of course, so many women have. So I, I'm, I'm really fascinated, not only by your work, but I'm fascinated to get your take on something that I, I don't know scientifically how to describe this concept, but it's something that I've noticed a huge pattern in. So here's, here's, kind of the interesting thing I've been doing lately. So one of the really cool benefits of having a pretty good audience is you'll get the opportunity to talk to a lot of people who will actually succeed in getting their exes back. Now we can debate the merits on if you should be getting an ex back, you know, later, but I'm kind of interested in dissecting specifically, like what did they do versus the people who were not successful? And one interesting pattern I'm noting is a lot of what you're talking about, which is like that internal value that they kind of they kind of get after the breakup, but there's also this really interesting phenomenon occurring where most of the time they'll start out with the blinders on where they want to get their exes back. And then slowly but surely as they go through my program and they kind of focus a little bit more on other things as opposed to their ex, they kind of get to this point where they're just like, I, I don't want them back anymore. And then the ex comes back. So I'm kind of curious to get your take on it. I've been asking everyone because it's something when I'm interviewing these success stories, it's something I consistently see happen. They, they get to like this internal mindset shift where they're just like, I don't care about him anymore. And then he comes back. So do you have any maybe scientific explanation for that? I mean, it's okay if you don't. I'm just kind of curious to pick your mind. Oh, yeah. I mean, we can really feel when somebody's attached to an outcome. So I studied attachment style theories under Mary Ainsworth, who was, of course, um, under the master student of Mary Ainsworth, I'm sorry, uh, who of, of course was studying under John Bowlby. And so, um, who is, by the way, you don't know John Bowlby, he's the grandfather of the soul attachment style theory. That's where everything started. And so uh, what oftentimes happens, men can feel when you're attached, right? They can feel it because you're coming from desperation, you're coming from fear, and you're coming also from a place of potentially resentment, but it's a negative emotion. And it's interesting, but men are actually much more intuitive 
than we give them credit for. And they can feel when you let go of that attachment. And that attachment then actually means trust, connection, and you're coming from a place of love. And who doesn't want to go back? Like, think about it this way, Chris. Would you rather go back to a place of, oh, if you come back to me, you get a lot of love. Or if you come back to me, you get a, a lot of fear and a lot of resentment and, right. and a lot no. of like, constriction, you know? Yeah, that makes sense. So so this is a, this is a fascinating topic because you know anytime I bring up attachment theory or attachment styles within our private Facebook group or to my clients, they eat it up. They love this stuff. But when you're talking about like the cues that men can pick up on, how how are those cues picked up on exactly? Are they just looking at specific types of communication, like tone of voice and things of that nature? Or is there is there more to it than that? Yeah, I mean, sometimes it is actually over time, people actually create a telepathic connection. Think about it this way. You think about a person and they call you. How right. do you explain that, right? Right, right. So we do have like, and we see it all the time in releasing a person workshops, things like that, where the guy calls afterwards. They didn't know that you were in a... <laughs> right, right. There's no way they knew. It's just... And then, yeah, I mean, we see that all the time where it's like, you know... And you've probably seen it in your life, just like I've seen it where you're thinking or you're watching a video about something that you hadn't seen in a long time. And then you go out walking and all of a sudden that's all you can see. Right, right. The reticular activating system, right? So, so I'm Absolutely. curious. So this is kind of more of a philosophical question at this point, but mm -hmm. let's say you are going through life where you've just watched this movie or something that you hadn't seen in years. And then you're going through life and all of a sudden you just see all these like things about this movie that you hadn't seen in years. Is, is it a function of kind of that aspect being drawn to you or you being a little bit more aware and being able to pick up those cues? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's such a good question because a lot of women actually think if the guy calls, that means they're meant to be, to be back right, together. Right, right? right? And that's not necessarily true. It could also be scientifically um, explained through, um, uh, what is it called? What I'm looking for, meta, metaphysical principles, right? Okay, yeah. And so how I see it, so <laughs> I still relate to this because, you know, I would like break up with a guy sort of, I mean, I was single my whole life, but I was always dating and, you know. You're married now though, was, to a great yeah, husband. Years, yeah. So she, this woman has the answers, guys. <laughs> I have all the answers, tell me. And I went through a lot of pain because I would literally drive down the street and then I would see a street name with the name of that guy, right? And I would be like, oh, Chris, it's a it's sign. Meant to be. <laughs> okay. It's my soulmate, right? Or yeah, like, I, I don't know. You're you know? preaching to the choir with my, with my audience because I can't tell you how often I see stuff like that where they're just yeah, like, oh, right? it's a, but it's a sign. We have to be together. But right, you're saying right. it's not necessarily true. No, it's not true. So what I always would say is like, just you can write it down in your journal like just as a marker, right? There's this really great book. It's called When God Wings on Love. And it talks about that, like those wings that we get, but we don't necessarily take action on them. It's fun to look back and be like, oh, wow, all along I got sent those signs, but it doesn't mean now get attached to something. So I would see it as more, oh, I'm on the right track, whether it's this guy or he's the bridge to the next guy. But how I would start to see it as more, I'm on the right track. Like I'm, I'm doing something right. Something is in the flow. I don't know what that something is because you don't know if Joe is just the opener to, I don't know, George. Right. right? And you're supposed to like see this guy again or remind yourself of something, have some sort of resolution with him and then meet the real guy. Um, so, really so no, no, no. I, I really love your explanation. And I think I just, I've done so many coaching sessions with people to know kind of their reaction when I try to explain the principle, you know, the Joe versus the George. It's sort of like, well, you know, I think a lot of times they get so hung up on trying to get their ex back that they don't realize maybe that one person's not the best for them in the long term. So how do you get someone to maybe open up their blinders a little bit to seeing the world from a 30,000 foot perspective, as opposed to just taking it like one little thing at a time? Right, right. I love this so much, right? You call this the meta perspective, like, or you have like the macro perspective versus the micro perspective where you're caught right. up in the weeds, right? Yeah, yeah. And um, so part of it is actually like seeing, okay, well, let's say you get Frank back, right? Uh, but you know, you're going to go through this pattern all the time where, you know, he doesn't call you every week or, you know, you don't know where he is on Saturday night. So imagine this would go on for 10 years. Would you be okay with that? Because 
I think when we think we want to get back with our ex, we think, you know, we just idealize the scenario, right? But we forget to actually acknowledge, well, what were all the things that I didn't like? What were all the things that like caused so much anxiety? We're talking about attachment styles today, right? That caused so much anxiety, mistrust, insecurity inside of yourself that really you want to live like that for the rest of your life? So actually saying yes to it, not saying, no, you can't have it or you shouldn't have it, but actually like, great, let's say you, you're going to get it. Let's say Frank comes back, but Frank is not going to change. Frank is going to stay the same. He may change for two weeks or three weeks so, and then he's going to go back into his patterns. So uh, that's an interesting point you bring up because I've noticed that what usually happens in most, so I've noticed about half of people who get back together will break up again within the first three months. And what I've noticed is when you study the half of the people that kind of don't stay together for a long term time, usually there is an immediate change at the beginning, but slowly but surely they kind of get back into their no, their old habits that cause the relationship. But l- let's say theoretically that you wanted to get Frank back. We'll use Frank as our obligatory yes, you know, boyfriend, Frank. ex-boyfriend, Frank. <laughs> so let's say we want to get Frank back and you, you succeed in getting Frank back. What would have to occur for Frank to change his ways, to basically pull his weight in the relationship? Or is that even possible, do you think? Well, so it really depends on if he chose to come back with you or if you guilt tripped him into it, which I'm yeah. sure that's probably a good thing all to... about it, right? Yeah, it's yeah. like yeah. Mm-hmm. making sure, if, particularly if he's more the avoidant. So if you're listening to this, you're maybe more on the anxious side of things, right? And just like anticipating, checking your phone every two seconds. And Frank may be more like, I need space. You know, I need my weekends. I need my, my buddies. You know, I need my world. And so then what needs to happen for you is for one, you need to change the dynamic with you. Now, how do you do that? Well, for one, you got it. You have to really work on your own insecurity inside of yourself. And one thing that I talk about is how to become secure in your insecurities. So not like fighting against it, like, oh, I feel shame right now. Oh my God, I should like use one of those shame shields, right? Like attacking or pretending it didn't happen. Or, you know, I feel... Um, I don't know. Somebody who said, I'm, I feel I'm selfish. Oh no, 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 no. I'm a giver and I'm generous and just constantly going against feeling insecure versus actually really leaning into that. So this is something that we actually talked about uh, last week when we just were getting to know each other. It turned into like this three hour hubbub back and forth. <laughs> oh, where we just, it was a really great conversation. We probably should have filmed that one, but <laughs> Um, totally the, the, this was this was something that you taught me that I really hadn't thought about before, which is like I think a lot of women and men for that matter, when they're going through breakups, they feel a lot of guilt, shame, things like that, and um, they hyper focus on their insecurities or the things that they did wrong. And I really loved your theory because I, I talk a lot a lot about this theory called the ungettable girl. So it's like mm-hmm. for women, strive to be this ungettable girl to where you're kind of like above men you don't put them on pedestals or kind of equals and uh i think I, I just love that concept of like kind of owning your insecurities so do you think you could talk a little bit more about someone who's having a really hard time doing that because i think someone listening to this are like oh yeah that sounds super cool but when it comes to owning something that you're you've been insecure about your entire life it's not like it's not like you're, we're gonna snap our fingers and that's just gonna fix so what what kind of strategies can someone have or or use to own their insecurities. Totally. So I'll give you an example. So I grew up in an emotionally absent household. So my mom was rather narcissistic and the core message was don't bother me. Right. So the last thing that I want to be, I have all kinds of insecurities around like being too much. And I mean, I used to still as always like residuals. Right. But there's this like, you know, don't be too much. Don't ask for too much. Right. And so 10 years ago, I was dating this guy and he said, well, you're, you're too affectionate. You kiss too much. You hug too much. And so in that moment, right, I learned how to advocate for that. So not say, what would a normal woman do? Well, normal woman, average woman, right? Would be like, oh, no, 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 it's, no, no, it's fine. You know what I mean? I'll give you your space or, you know, or she'd be like, well, too bad, you know? So you'd be either go into attack and be like, who do you think you are? Or you would go into pretending it didn't happen, right? Um, That Brene Brown talks about that. Those are shame shields. And so, but I just said, well, this is who I am just smiled. And then he, then he felt actually his shame because most people, when they say something, they just say it because you have a charge around it. 
they can feel unconsciously when you don't feel secure with something and they will speak to that, right? So now I was secure in that in that moment and I was, I would call advocate for my insecurity, so to say, or for my needs, right? And so now he was faced with his own shame. So now he backtracked. He actually ended up using a shame shield and said, oh no, just kidding, but no, trade. Like, I love you and you're awesome, you know what I mean? And he ended up pursuing me and calling me. He was actually going on a trip and he called me every day, whatever state he was in, left me voicemails, you know? And so it really changed something where I always tell the women, it's not about insecurities that you have. I don't care if it's an insecurity about being, wanting to be famous. So people are like, oh, you just want to feel important. You know, who do you think right, you are? Right. so arrogant? Or if it's around something more, you know, being too much or not being smart enough or whatever it is, we all have all those different stories. But if a man sees that you just stand there and you're, yeah, that's me, right? They don't know what else are they going to say, right? Like, you, you know, it's like they're telling me that I have blonde hair. What am I supposed to say to that? Like, it's true. I have blonde hair. So now yeah, what? That's true, right. <laughs> Well, I mean, I think in this odd way, if you really think about it, we don't look so like we, we obviously it, it's hard to change external aspects. Like, you know, you use the blonde hair, like right. you're not going to change the blonde hair, but we almost look at personalities as the separate entity from ourselves. Like they're, they're this, this changeable thing. And it's not that it's not like simple to change something like that. Mm -hmm. And I really love the the concept because the way I look at it, the way I would frame it is like by owning some of your insecurities, you appear more confident to the other person. And sometimes supreme confidence in oneself can be blinding to the other person. So that I think that's like almost like why they backtrack, you know, they don't know, they've never seen a human being do that before where they're just like, yeah, yeah, I'm this way, you know, that just, that's how I am. Yeah. Um, which yeah. I really, I really love. Um, do you have any, so you work with a lot of women, Obviously, right. I, I work with thousands of single successful women all over right. so, all ages, all stages. So I always curious, say, do, you, do you have any other because I feel like this concept may be one of the most important for my audience to grasp, mm -hmm. which is like just owning those insecurities. Do you have any other um stories from women who have done this on dates that maybe can like sometimes I think my my audience needs to see he see like lots of different success stories to to kind of like really hammer how important this point is. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I have like one story of one client and she was told by this guy that, uh, she's a bitch. Okay. And, uh, so you it's, know, it's funny. Uh, my, my wife, uh, when I met her, um, we were, we were driving. I did not call her a bitch. I wanted to put that out, but, but I said, <laughs> I said, I said something along the lines of like, Oh, you're kind of sassy. And she's like, no, I'm just a sweet bitch. Um, so I think she did one of those things without me even, recognizing it until six years later but what what impact did that have on you in that moment chris like tell well, us. i i think i just laughed because i had never seen a girl call herself a bitch before and she she was like no no i'm not a bitch i'm a sweet bitch um and she just kind of owned it you know it was like i had never i didn't know how to react to it i i don't think i i backtracked on it i think i just started laughing and it became like this weird inside joke but i think it was her way of just owning maybe some of the the edgier parts of her personality and it worked but uh so maybe wow you you used me as the example how dare you <laughs> yeah <laughs> no, no, you're actually, so you, you've got this client uh, who's being called a bitch or she yeah and then and then and and then she said yes i am and so you know? what is and, and so he, what he, does he, he like, say to that he, he was completely flabbergasted. He was like, he, he didn't know what to say. He's like, uh, he, he, he was like speechless. <laughs> he was like, he, he was like, are you serious? You know, like, so he was really like, you know what I mean? He didn't need to collect himself. You know? so, and, look, so what's interesting is, I mean, we're dealing with the audience we're talking to here is dealing with like, they've literally gone through breakups. And yeah. so I feel like the pushback they would have to this concept is like, well, what if those qualities, those insecurities about myself is the reason that he broke up with me? Should I still do this? I guarantee you nine out of 10 times, that's her own self-perception. That's yep. not why. It's because she judges herself and she actually activates that judgment then inside of himself. But if she actually were to hold her own in a relationship, men don't leave. They don't leave. 
if you hold your own in a relationship, you have your heart open, you're the sweet bitch. I love that. I call it the queen. It's between the doormat and the bitch, okay. right? I love the sweet bitch. That's sweet awesome. Bitch. Yeah. You know, so you have the boundaries you can, of the bitch. You can feel free to use that, but you have to give... You might, that, I that totally wife is totally. That's it's, totally good. Friend, totally. That's so oh. right. Right. But like, if you get to be the, the sweet bitch, you know, and, and so you're holding your own, but you're still in your heart. That means you come from a place of compassion versus resentment. Men don't leave. Right. Why is that? Well, because you give them access to inside of their own heart. They have their own wounds from their childhood that they're trying to protect and you know, manage and navigate. Right. And that's why they ultimately break up because you hit a wall with them. You hit some sort of ceiling, some sort of threshold where they're out of resources, right? But if you're saying, hey, I have the resources, I'm right here. I love all of me, right? Like, how about we love all of you? How about I'm not becoming defensive when you yell at me or be angry, but maybe we can see a world like where we can hold space for that for ourselves. How, do we, how about we see that those are parts of us versus all of us and we become so over identified with it and take it so personally so that's what i would say to that so i would bet with you that that's not the real reason it's more about how she relates to that yeah i mean i I totally 100 percent agree uh with you and i think actually coming into a new relationship and or, or even an old relationship with this mentality it's kind of like it changes the trajectory because I, like to your point, it's like, okay, when you were insecure and you wouldn't own those insecurities in the relationship, it's, of course, it's going to create this sort of toxic environment where you lash out maybe, but by kind of owning it, it, it adds this new dynamic to where he's forced to kind of like see like, oh, wow, I didn't know, I didn't know that was allowed. Cause I don't think people know it's allowed to, to basically say like, oh yeah, I'm a sweet bitch or, oh yeah, I'm, I'm this way or this way. They, they, mm-hmm. it, it feels a little like breaking the rules, but I feel mm-hmm. like, I feel mm-hmm. like sometimes that's how you have to add a new dynamic to your relationship. Mm-hmm. But uh, so I've noticed also, and this is something I think is really relevant to my audience. You work with a lot of women who have dated narcissists. So yes. What kind, of, what kind of just outlooks or kind of insights can you give my audience who? is deeply in love with someone who's extremely narcissistic and maybe shouldn't be trying to get that extremely narcissistic person back. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So look, you have to understand how are you a narcissist magnet, right? Versus a narcissist repellent, which is why I, you know, you put the insect repellent on, right? right? So you become a narcissist repellent. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, get them. Do you have a spray? Is there a spray we can buy? (laughs) We'll have a cream, you know what I mean? Okay, a cream. cream. Yeah, sorry. Or you go on dates. But seriously, so em- narcissists go for empaths. So people who are naturally more other focused, but narcissists, as we know, are very self-rotating, right? Yeah. So they're like parasites. So the more you focus on other people, meaning you make focusing on yourself wrong, but I just said before, right? If you're like, well, no, I'm not a bitch or no, I'm not selfish. Great great target for narcissists okay. because they're like, oh, great. All I have to tell her, like, don't be so selfish. I right. just have to gaslight her. Yeah. And then she's just going to focus on me. You know what okay. I mean? It's all going to be about me. And not only that, but she has like um, her, her intrinsic self-esteem is starting to break down because I make her question and doubt herself because her self-esteem comes from outside approval. So if I don't approve of her, I can break her down. Great. Now I can make her question herself leave her family, leave her friends, and just give me all her resources, all her love, all her money. I mean, I've heard it all from like writing over loans and credits and co-sign things. I mean, it, it goes pretty far uh, what narcissists are able to accomplish with a woman that's so other focused. So what would you say to a woman who has been broken up with by a narcissist and wants the narcissist to back? Because I personally don't think going back to a narcissist is probably the best thing for your sanity. Mm-hmm. What would you say to someone who would argue with my point, which is like, hey, don't do it? How, how would you get them to maybe redirect to a more healthy relationship? Yeah, so one thing that she has to understand, yes, there's a part inside of her that wants to have this guy back. 
And I would not fight that because you more fight that, the more protection, the more management comes up and the more she actually hardens and she's not receptive. But we're like, okay, great. So let's say you're getting back. We put that one over here. So I'm not saying it's not going to happen, but let's take the other scenario too. Like, let's look at that side too. And that's actually you becoming your own narcissist. So what I would most likely do is I would draw out like everything she's experienced in her life. Every time when she's given her power away, how this all started in her childhood, how she tried to turn herself into a pretzel, right? Like how her dad was telling her, who do you think you are? So mm -hmm. I would actually, like when we're talking about before giving a bigger perspective, a macro perspective, right. that would be a good moment to do that because she's so caught up. And a woman wants to go back with a narcissist, which usually when my women come to me, there's no way they want to get back with a narcissist. They want to get as far away as possible from that. But what they don't understand is that they have to become a narcissist themselves. Well, so I think that there's the correlation there would probably be because someone who is naturally drawn to someone who's very narcissistic wants to be very sympathetic to others or empathetic to others. And they don't really think they're, I th so what I've found in general in relationships is a lot of times people, when they make a relationship decision, they try to make it out of self-interest, but there are exceptions. And I feel like these would be the exceptions, people who are kind of selfless by nature. And, you know, we all hear the, like the, the, the women who are drawn to fixer uppers. So these are the women who are highly like, they just need a problem to fix so that they can feel good because they're doing good, you know? And I think, so, so like someone like that is basically what you're saying is they need to get to this point where they own that and stop giving the narcissist power. I mean, like, like what That's is, what is the, how do they get over that mental block? I guess, I guess is, yeah. is my yeah, question. It's really, it's, it's really about like any resistance that you have around being selfish, right? So Chris, if I ask you or, or the women who are watching, right, when you think of a narcissist, like what? What kind of woman is narcissistic, right? Oh, she's like, she doesn't care and she's just all about herself and whatever. She, they would just throw some adjectives and some attributes at me, right? right, right. And, well, great. You get to embrace that now. Meanness, nastiness. Oh, a nasty woman is a narcissist. Great. Now you get to embrace the nastiness. So now you not only get to be a sweet bitch, you also get to be a nasty bitch. And okay. I'm actually super, super serious because I've gone through this process myself and I have lots of women that come from very like nice backgrounds where nobody's saying anything and everything is brushed under the carpet, right? Um, and they learn to embrace that and just really say, we're doing self-absorption exercises, absorbing yourself, right? Because people use self-absorption as a word, as an insult. If I say, Chris, you're so self-absorbed, right. you would never think, I'll thank you for the compliment. Yeah, right. right. But a so, narcissist well, would maybe. <laughs> Yeah, and that's just, oh, thank you so much. No, they would gaslight you. They're like, no, you are the, the self-absorbed one. Right. right. Because they're projected out. But it's really, it's actually the opposite. So everything that charges you up, right, that's what you're actually like working on, right? So we're having a whole self-absorption party and it's great. And actually break down what self-absorption really means um, because usually um, it's the other way around. It's actually we're absorbing other people, not ourselves not enough of ourselves. Um, and that is the balance between focusing on other people and focusing on ourselves to really create a healthy interdependence. Because what the women, the woman that wants to go back to a narcissist is in a codependent pattern. Mm -hmm. And I will break that all down to her, but I'll have her answer the questions because I'm not going to tell her anything because she already decided she wants to go back. Right. So what I would do is like, I would ask her questions and really, really think this through because remember we delete we distort and we generalize reality all day long based on our unconscious expectations. So we got to break that down because otherwise we're in our illusion, you know, of like what that relationship is like. So, so what seems fascinating to me is I think for the first time ever, um, you're saying, I mean, I've never heard this before, which is really interesting, which is like, look, if you're drawn to narcissists and you're just like this, incredible empath and you really don't think about yourself a lot you need to learn to become more narcissistic That's but right. is is there so my my understanding of it would be like okay you don't need to embody and become a full narcissist but you need to you need to take some of those selfish qualities and use them on yourself so that you can achieve the balance between being selfish and also being kind of empathetic so that you're not losing maybe the 
empath part of yourself, but you're also looking after yourself a little bit more than you would have before. Is, is that an accurate way of saying, or are you, are you saying just turn full heel and just go completely narcissistic yourself? Yeah, go completely the other way because when somebody is so far on this side, okay. So if I tell them to go all the way, then they maybe end up in the middle. Go in the middle. Okay. They're gonna have so much self-perceptive um, distortions inside of themselves that by the time they're like, "Auntie, was so nice. Tell me, what did you do?" Well, I just you know said something. I was like, "Well, that be what any confident person would say." Got That's it. So, fun. so essentially, it's almost like they have. It's it's almost like they don't have a good alignment metric within themselves. So they don't, so it's like for someone who's extremely selfless and that's the way I view people who are probably like more narcissistic focused. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They don't really know what it's like to be selfish. So even if you tell them to be selfish, it's impossible for them to go so far to the other end because they just don't know how to do it. And I'm assuming you came up with that concept through a bit of trial and error with real clients after telling them like, Hey, just go and be, be a narcissist yourself. And you're just hearing like their, their narcissist behavior is like basic confident behavior. That's not narcissistic at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, first of all, I have a narcissistic mom myself. That means I naturally will have a hyper-masculine narcissistic distortion inside of myself because if we have like an extreme parent, we will that ha will have that as a distortion but we will not know about it, right? Because we're hiding it from ourselves. But I was always manipulated by, by people, including my mom. And the minute somebody would say, you're so selfish, I would like bend over backwards, guilt trip 101, right? And I was just sick and tired of it. It never worked for me. Um, I was disrespected by men left and right, right? So I was like, you know, I just have to, I literally came up for this myself because I said, well, well, I got to, you know, when I learned about shadow work, I don't know how much, uh, you know, you've talked about shadow work with your clients. No, I would, so we're going to go into that. You have yeah, to tell let's us talk what about that is. <laughs> that's actually where it all started, right? So, um, so right away, definitely give credit here. Um, Debbie Ford, of course, she died a few years ago, but she wrote this really great book. It's called The Dark Side of the Light Chaser, and it talks about shadow work. And so shadow work essentially is looking at yourself and, or looking outside of yourself actually, and see what are you judging in those other people? And so with my mom, I would always say, she's such a narcissistic bitch, right? Okay. So then I was like, well, wait a minute. If I take this work on, the shadow work actually says, whatever you judge in someone else is what you have inside of yourself. Okay. <gasps> okay, take a deep breath right now, ladies. So it's almost, <laughs> almost kind of like uh, Freud's id or the yeah, super is, ego yeah. or, or something like that where they're, you know, I think the shadow work actually comes from Jung um, originally. Okay. But yeah, yeah, exactly. And so basically, then you get to say, well, great, then where am I narcissist, right? So now I get to embrace my own inner narcissist. Okay. So basically, great. you have it in you. You just That's don't right. think you do. That's right. The reason why you'd know that is because other people would maybe see my mom and they wouldn't have a problem with anything. They wouldn't be charged. They would just notice something and it's just like, you know, it's like breathing. So they don't have a charge in it. So they may, they don't have that like hidden inside of themselves. Maybe they right. already have it integrated or they don't really care about it. they you know, that's selfish in a healthy way, whatever the case may be. But when you charged up about something, right? Like, you know, this cruel person or this nasty person, well, that's this arrogant person. It's another one. Uh, then you get to embrace that inside of yourself. Right. And okay. so, that's a really deep journey. And this is a journey of self-honesty. It's incredibly deep and it's not designed for everyone. I mean, this is this definitely not, you know, uh, it's no joke to say, wait, wait a minute. You're saying I suffered my whole life from like narcissistic abuse. And you're telling me I have that inside of myself. Are you freaking out of your mind? Right? So that was like my first reaction. But then I was like, over time, I was like, I was watching dynamics and I was looking at, oh, wow, in this dynamic with a friend, I'm the one who talks more or I'm the one who like sort of anchors more into her or take the resources or whatever. But again, it takes this willingness to be wrong because the body, the system, the unconscious always wants to be right. So you have to be like, oh, okay, maybe I'm doing this a little over here. Maybe I'm a little arrogant over here. You know, maybe I'm a little fake over here, right? And so essentially, Chris, we have all parts inside of ourselves. But the question is, 
which of those parts have we hidden from ourselves and then attract in response and reflection in the other person. So essentially they just remind us what we already have inside of ourselves. So then essentially it's a really big gift, you know? Yeah. It's, it's such a fascinating in an odd way of looking at it because I don't think anyone looks at the situation that way at all. Right. Yeah. No. Well, so you, you were talking and you have one of the most fascinating backgrounds period. So <laughs> I, I, I hadn't known that about your mom before this moment, but you basically lived your life in Germany and then you came over here to the U S to study at Berkeley. Mm -hmm. Right. And you get your degree at Berkeley and you work with hundreds of people and all that. But what I'm really fascinated by, and this is something I see in my own coaching practice, but I'm kind of curious of your personal experience with it, which is it's not enough necessarily for me sometimes to tell people what they need to do or show them what they need to do. They need to experience it for themselves to have the effect. And so you talk about your mom being narcissistic, right? And I'm, I'm curious would you think she was narcissistic before you came to Berkeley and started studying? Did you have those thoughts or was it after you went to Berkeley kind of learned some of these concepts that, that it just clicked for you or did it take you learning the concepts, but actually applying it in your own life to click for you? Uh, I think the biggest thing for me was learning about attachment styles. I will never forget when I open up my textbook in my developmental psych class. And I literally, I kid you not, Chris, I read this page about the anxious attachment style. Yeah. And I feel like, they, they took my life and documented it and put it in the book. Wow. So I, you're, you're just like I seeing thought. this and you're immediately like, that's me. That's me. I thought the whole time there's something wrong with me. I don't know. I have a curse on me or literally my mom would always say, we have curses. My mom got divorced when she was 10, of, uh, when, when I was 10 years old, uh, you know, and my brother was never in a long-term relationship and I was struggling. And so we're all like, oh, it's this family curse, right? There's like, which there's actually something to it. It's called family entanglement, but it's a whole different story. Um, so it's not, it's not a curse. But there was something apology. wrong with me. You know what I mean? Something. Okay. Is so you, so you, you, you see the anxious attachment. You're like, this is me. And then what happens after that? Well, after that, now I actually had a framework. So now I could actually create tools for myself. Right. So for example, now I knew, Oh, I'm yes. I see myself walking down the aisle with this guy. If you see all my journal entries, you know, like I meet a guy and I say, he's my soulmate. And then like three weeks later, I meet another guy. He's my soulmate. Uh, <laughs> That's very difficult. How anyone. many soulmates did you meet? <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know. I don't know. 30. You found the real one though. As you can see in the picture back there, she's married. Yeah. So, and, and here's the thing too, with that is when you heal your attachment style, my husband didn't feel like my soulmate. He told me that the first night we met, he told me I'm the girl of his story, but I didn't feel this like, Oh my God, he's my soulmate because I finally had like sort of healed that attachment to that outcome. And the, I call it the future anticipation. Right. And I'm like, I'm just here. I'm in Hawaii. You know, I don't know what happens. I just landed 10 days ago and let's see what unfolds for me. So being more, make the unknown your friend was what I started to do. Because I was always walking my friends down the aisle. I had my little support groups because I knew a lot of stuff, you know, and they're always coming to me for advice, but it was never working for me. So I just said, you know, I'm just going to go to Hawaii and I'm just going to just focus on myself, right? And just like totally let go, let go and let God, so to say. And 10 days later, I met my husband and it just felt natural, Chris. It just felt like breathing. I, could, I told him everything. He knew my attachment style within a few weeks. And he, he was accepting me. I had a breakdown, you know, I think one month in, into us dating and I tried to push him away. And I okay. just, I could tell you stories. You know? <laughs> so I, actually the pushing away thing is, is interesting. Cause I'm curious, like, what is the psychology in you, in, in your experience of why you push him away? Cause I'm dealing with oh, a, yeah. a, a male client who has a, ha, has a female doing that to him right now. And I'm, uh, yeah. for me, it's, it, it's kind of easy to understand how men work for me because I'm a guy, but the female oh. mind is a little bit, you know, uh, sometimes I'm like, I need a little help. So what, so why were you pushing your husband away? I mean, this is someone you ended up marrying. So what, what, what is the, what's the rub? So, so picture this, right? So here's this anxious attachment style. She's used to an avoidant attachment style who's, you know, calls her every other week or, you know, is he still into me? And there's this constant questioning. There's this constant up and down, right? There's those promises, and then they're not being kept. So there's this hope and then there's a disappointment. 
So there's just a lot of activation in the body. Then I meet a man who just, there's not that. It's just natural. He just tells me I'm the one. He calls me. He's not over, overbearing or anything. He just still do his thing. And so my system essentially was feeling like this is a foreign body. I don't know what this is, right? Okay. Like I, I can't compare it to anything. I had no category for that because we were uh, starting to be physically intimate relatively early on. And probably part of the reason was because I'm like, I, I don't know, it's probably just a friend or something like that, right? Because <laughs> I'm like, but then we have this physical connection too. So it's not just a friend. So yeah, my system. And then what does a system do when it feels in the unknown? It pushes away, right? Right. It's It'll try to purge it. Just like right. get it away. Get, let's get it out of the system, right? Like, I don't know what to do with this. This is unfamiliar. That means I also don't know how to behave, that all my known structures and behavioral patterns. Remember, Chris, I had all those rules, which I'm sure a lot of women are watching. You have all right. those rules before I get intimate with somebody and how long we need to be exclusive and right, all right. the stuff. You have to jump through all the hoops and you equally just cut out of my life if you call me five minutes late. And, uh, and so out of the sudden, there's no... I can't apply any rules, right? So then I'm like, who am I? So eventually I went through almost like an identity crisis, right? Because I'm like, without my rules, without my behavioral patterns, because none of that I can apply, who am I? The system's not going to go for that. It, it's going to, it's going to push it out, right? It's going to say, this is, I, I can't, I can't do this. This is, so this how, is weird. How do you overcome that in someone else? So let's, so let's put ourselves in your husband's shoes. Oh how yeah, did, I could how did he you. overcome that? Because obviously you, you try to purge the emotion away. I did. Like, yeah. I like did. I, I like I don't know what to do with this. This is like an unfamiliar street I'm on. How yeah. did he basically lure you back? Because I think that's the quandary that many of the people here are having. Literally through his confidence, right? So I would go to this party and I would drink two bottles of champagne. Now I don't drink at all, right? So yeah, me too. Me right too. <laughs> you know what I mean? But I drank two bottles of champagne. Trying to look cool with the champagne. I mean, like usually people just drink beer, but no, no, you went right to the champagne. Which yeah, I went funny. to the champagne and I ignored him the whole night. He's like, happy Friday, you know, because he was at this party and I, I was like, why are you here? I didn't invite you. I'm here with my friends. It's so why go to other places, go sailing, go snorkeling. There's so much to do here. Um, so, but he was not coming to me. He's not trying to convince me or anything. Right. He was just like, so he's, me. so he's, he's physically around, but he's not right. like. It's like, like why, why are you here? And he's like, like oh, I'm here and he just ignores you. Yeah, like, so I, it, like, so basically he's like, okay, she chooses to, I don't know what's going on with her, let, let her go through the motions, right? Because again, as a secure, he doesn't have to say like, oh my God, what's going on in the unknown, right? He's good in the unknown because he was loved in the unknown, right? Like he knows when something in the unknown, he has hope, you know, he has connection, love, warmth. He learned all of that as a child because it's a secure attachment style. Um, so, and then, so then I had to be with myself. So you don't want to push against it. You want to give the woman the space to be with it. So then of course, at the end of the night, what did I do, Chris? I texted him and I said, you know, I think I ignored you the whole night. You know, and I just, I was like, I don't even know what I'm doing. I don't even know who I am. Like, I don't know what's happening. You know what I mean? I had a breakdown and then I broke up with him like a week, a week later. Cause I'm like, I, just, I don't know. This is just all, this is all too much for me. You know what I mean? Like my system can handle it. And he was and like, again, he's thing. like, cool. Like, okay. Yeah, he just like went to his workshop, but then I forgot my towel in his backpack. And again, he was just giving me the towel back. And then I, I just was drawn to him because he was not trying to convince me. I had my space to move from, through my emotions. And he actually said later on that he's like, well, I was just like, I just giving you space. I just knew you're moving through your emotions. I'm here. I, I know you're the one. So I know you're going to get to it at some point. And just this resting confidence. And there's also this sort of like quiet unattachment, right? He's, he was just not attached. And I could feel it. I could feel it. I could feel the space. And then basically my fear could, I needed space. Because remember, my mom is a narcissist. So I didn't have any space at all for my own experience, right? So this man gives me all the space so I can feel everything and move through everything. And then guess what? If, if you don't have anything that we that pushes against us, we come out the other side. Of course we do. We're human beings. We're, we're dynamic human beings. So we move through our emotional cycles. And at the end, we're like, hmm, okay, still here. 
You know what I mean? The guy's still there. <laughs> you know I mean? Yeah, I just, so, and I just, yeah. That, that's a really fascinating story because there's a lot going on there. Were you aware of the attachment style theory when this was going on? No, I mean, I had studied it at UC Berkeley, but actually in that moment, I wasn't because I was so caught up in everything that was happening. And mind you, I was seeing other guys and, you know, I was distracting myself and I'm, you know, I was like, this is this foreign body. I don't know. You know what I mean? I was actually taking for granted in a way. I'm like, yeah, he's always going to be here. So whatever. Um, okay. But eventually I, just that quiet confidence of, of basically I saying like, that. No, it was, I was too much like caught up in this, like, just seeing it more like as a friend or something, something, I don't know what, what I was thinking, you know, but just some, this unlabeled experience, you know what I mean? That was easy. And, um, but yeah, I had this whole experience of, it needs to be the fireworks and there needs to be this, all of it together, okay. this high level of charge. And I wasn't there. So I was like, you know, it's not my one, but you know, we're, we're having fun and- <laughs> And I guess it kind of goes into what you're saying about kind of people needing to be right. You know, and the fact that your framework no longer applies to this one guy, it's like, well, I, it's not right. This, it's just like, okay, well, let me, let, let, there's some, I'll do something else. Yes, and, that's right. That's right. <laughs> so anything, anything, right? Like in that moment, I became also irrational because remember, if you don't have anything to hold, now you're just becoming irrational because you don't even know anything anymore, right? So now right. you become unpredictable. You do weird things. You push them away. <laughs> you break right, up right. hours, and so on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, one thing I would like to say about you is not only do you have an amazing YouTube channel, but you do have these really cool sounding coaching mastermind groups that you were telling me about uh, last time. So first off, we'll do the YouTube plug for you. So tell us where we can find you on YouTube since you have this awesome growing channel. So yeah, what do so, we type into YouTube to find you? Yeah, Antia Boyd, A-N-T-I-A-B-O-Y-D. So don't, like, in this. Or, or we could do, mag, would, if, if they type in magnetize your man. Your man, yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. so yeah. there you go. But really, <laughs> what I would like to hear more, you tell more of my audience about are these really amazing mastermind, because that's how I viewed it. I don't know if that's how you kind of, like, pitch it, but I viewed it like these mastermind groups and they're like high level mastermind groups with like 12 women, right? How, how many women per call? Yeah. So t between 12 and 20 women, you know, somewhere, okay. somewhere around there. Yeah. Uh -huh. So tell, tell us how those work exactly. Like how long are the calls? Like, are, are they weekly? Are they monthly? Just give us the. Right, 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 right. Yeah, no, I mean, it's like, it's like a longer program. It's a six months long program and um, it takes you through the three stages, right? So it goes to the mapping stage. Then it goes into the magnification stage, which is where all the fear is coming up. Like, I don't want to be narcissist. I don't want to be too big, too bright, too bold, any of that, right? So breaking through all the stories that you have, that's where the shadow work comes in mostly, is the magnification stage. And then the manifestation stage, that's actually where you're looking at how are you sabotaging relationships, right? Where can you literally not receive relationships? Because Chris, you probably see that it, with, with your women, they're also sabotage it too where they're like, oh, he didn't give me this. And I passive aggressively just hung up my, on him. My, or just favorite, like my favorite sabotage story ever was there was a girl who we were helping to try to get her ex back. And mm -hmm. she was having really a lot of success. She had a lot going for her. And she had gotten the guy and he's sitting next to her on the couch. And he goes, do you ever think about getting back together? And she didn't know what to do. So she, she starts texting us to like, what do I say? Like with him on the couch right there, we're just like, <laughs> She's oh, like yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that's probably the best sabotage story. And obviously he did not, they did not get back together. I think she, she got into an argument with him or, or something. Because uh, she texted, because she texted you guys. Like she was like, okay. No, uh, I think, I think, we didn't see the text message or the Facebook message. I can't remember. It was a couple of years ago uh, yeah. until like hours after this had occurred. Um, right. And so because she didn't know what to do, she just started panicking and just, I think just like you said, purge that away. She didn't know how to, how to handle it because I think when that, that taught us that sometimes we, we can't coddle people. I think we were coddling her too much. Like we were giving her too much, like, like do this, do this, do this, like too many steps. And right. ultimately she didn't think for herself. And so we've tried to pull back on doing that for people. And 
that's worked for the most part. But yeah, that's my, my favorite sabotage story. <laughs> you know what probably also happened with her, right? It's like, so usually when women don't want to be too forthright, so he's already like, hey, do you ever think of getting back together? And she probably wanted to say yes with all the fiber of her being, right? But right. Well, so yeah, to be needy. No, 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 you're absolutely right. So what was really interesting about her is she had, she was one of the worst insecure attachments I had ever seen. I mean, it was like, I've never seen anything, any person this insecure. So we were constantly explaining to her and we didn't know, I didn't know the best way to maybe tell someone that, but we were being very blunt with her and saying like, look, this is the type of behavior that's pushing him away. And so I think the fact that we made her aware of that kind of messed with her a little bit to where she, she had those thoughts that you're talking about, where she's like, well, I'm afraid to seem over eager you know, and so she just kind of just doesn't know what to do. Yeah. So that's like an anxious avoidant, right? So we okay. actually have the anxiety underneath. And that's what we're addressing in that, in that last stage is actually what we always forgetting is when we sabotage, we're going actually into avoidance. Of course. Okay. We do. That's right, how you sabotage. Right. You know what I mean? You're yeah. like not communicating. And if, so she, she would, she would do, so she got into an argument and obviously they kind of split up. And then of course she wants him back even more. Then. Yeah, yeah. So it's yeah. it's kind of this interesting back and forth dynamic, and yeah. But that that that's by far my favorite sabotage story. <laughs> yeah, that's wow. I love that she like really texted you, and I just to this instant WhatsApp access and all that, right? But you know, I mean, sometimes you sleep, or you know, I mean, something. Yeah, I can't be around forever. My wife was helping <laughs> her too, so she can't be around forever. So it just you know, it just is what it is sometimes. Um, but but I in would... that, it's really about like sharing, right? Like it's the authenticity. I did this with my husband too. You know, I was like telling him, Hey, part of me wanted to manipulate you. That was like six months of us dating. Right. And he's like, really, how did you want to do that? And so in doubt, I would always say share to overcome that avoidance. Right. And we talk about that, of course, in the, in the sabotage stage, how to actually create more authenticity and more transparency in that stage because you can, you're not going to survive in any other way. So, the, otherwise- so the, these are all stages that you talk about in essentially these huge mastermind calls between 12 and 21 women. So yeah. mm-hmm. what, That's so fine. how long, so the calls are weekly, correct? If yeah. I'm uh-huh. remembering correct. And That's how long are, is the average call? Oh, I mean the group calls, they're like two hours, you know, two because hours. obviously we're so, getting, so getting also- Done, you know <laughs> would you also say there's a really cool benefit to the fact that there's other women who also hear your situation or and are able to give advice as well on top of the advice you can give all the time as a matter of fact sometimes i come in and it's like all the questions i answered because they're like oh so and so already answered this for me or okay. i totally relate to her yeah a lot of women have breakthroughs because think about it when you hear somebody else's story your defense mechanisms are down because you're like well it's not about me so I, you're going to be even more listening, uh, yeah, it, even it more seems, carefully, It seems right? like a fantastic way and something I feel like I should start doing for my own audience. But it seems like a fantastic way because one thing I've noticed in our fa- private Facebook group is that a lot of that happens. And it's cool because you're hyper picking like these really, these, these women who can get really close and kind of bond. And I'm sure you've had like friendships happen over these these business these, partnerships. I mean, right. books written together, you know, often cool. books together. I mean, just incredible. And that's why I said like, you know, now we really call it like a sister of mine because it's like really, I mean, incredible friendship, lifelong business partnerships, soul, soul sisterships, I will almost so, say. So I let's mean, say someone listening to this podcast episode or watching this YouTube video is interested in signing up for one of these. Where do they have to go to sign up? Yeah, so you go to magnetizeyourman.com and so take the quiz there so we kind of know where right, you're there, at. There's a, so the, so if, if you don't know where to go, it's magnetizeyourman.com, which again, I'm going to reiterate one of the coolest names ever for a, for a business. Um, and uh, like me, she has a free quiz. Yes. Uh, and what, so what does your free quiz do exactly? Yeah, well, it, is, it just really shows you like what's actually going on, where you're stuck, what are your blind spots, where are the distortions? Uh, so it tells me a lot. There's a lot going on. And I'm also, yeah, there's a lot of different like uh, levels that I look at. Okay. Um, so it's, it's basically giving you an assessment, I guess is a good way of putting it. Yeah, of yeah where... it's an assessment, really seeing where do you not feel supported, where do you not okay. feel cherished, where you're distorted towards your hyper masculine versus your hyper feminine. And it's, it's like, yeah. And then they also get free personalized gifts. 
okay. with that as well in response to that. Okay. So you're getting all of those goodies plus the assessment. And then from there, does it lead you to kind of like say, hey, we think this is probably the best type of uh a phone call, mastermind, yeah. high, sisterhood, mind hive. I forgot, you, had, you came up with a really cool name for it. I, I forgot. I'm blanking. What was it? Sister, sister mind. Yeah. Sister, sister mind. Got it. <laughs> um, and so, so but that's basically bring in a little bit more femininity, you know, the women that's are true. So, so is there, is there, are men allowed in these calls? No. Okay. So no. it's a, it's an all girls thing, ladies. Yeah. So you're not going to see me in there, but you know, <laughs> what, what about someone who's uh, part of the LGBTQ community? Are they allowed in there? Um, yeah. I mean, we have like, uh, we have like one woman just joined. Um, okay. Yeah. I mean, I just never had them come to me, but like, yeah, we can definitely talk about okay. it. Yeah. Okay. So basically if you want to get access to this really, and like I said, I, I feel like I feel like it's really helpful just to have this this these group of individuals who knows each other's situations like the like the backside of their hand, and then every week they're just digging deep and trying to like improve. And right. so if you so if you want these calls or if you want access to this resource, all you have to do is go to our website magnetizeyourman.com, take the free quiz, and then you'll be directed from there to whatever fits your your situation. Mm -hmm. So uh, again. Thank you so much for coming on. This was one of the most mind-blowing episodes because I feel like I learned so much, especially about the owning the insecurity thing. I'm going to totally tell some of my clients to do that and see what happens. Uh -huh. uh, they'd be like, what? Yeah, right? <laughs> How do I do that? Yeah, yeah, totally, totally. But it really takes those unconventional methods to create unconventional results. I mean, you want to have it's, unconventional it's results, right? Where you have a very high likelihood to get the guy back. Well, you know, you got to do something unconventional. You got to cut through the, through the chase, right? Yep. So thank you so much for coming on. Thank you so much for having me, Chris.